On this episode of Ask Dr. Bitcoin, we're gonna go over the basics. We're gonna talk about what is blockchain, how to set up a Bitcoin wallet, and then we're gonna talk a bit about the Gollum project. Stay tuned. Well, hello there, I'm Mark Risen Hopkins, and this is Ask Dr. Bitcoin. I'm a cryptocurrency and blockchain enthusiast going back to 2011. Uh, shortly after uh, I discovered cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, I started writing a column called Ask Dr. Bitcoin. I launched a website, done some videos. So this is kind of the next iteration of that, where we're just going to uncompact a lot of the basic concepts and even some of the more advanced ones and look at some things that happen in the news, what the new projects are in the space, and just try to make this generally a more demystified thing for everybody to get a hold of. So today we're going to explore the concept of blockchain. It's a very basic concept, but it's, uh, it's, it's one that's foreign and brand new to most of the world. So we're gonna try to dive into it and get a little bit of foundational knowledge here. Blockchain, very succinctly, is the idea that you can remove the requirement for trust between counterparties. Now let's, un let's, let's uncompact that a little bit and see what that means. Whenever you have uh, trust in a business relationship, typically that's a, gets considered to be a good thing. So like if I you know, have your trust, I'm able to sell you, you know, my widgets and uh, because you believe me when I say there are great widgets, the best widgets, everyone says so. But whenever you have widgets, or whenever you have, sorry, whenever you have trust in a business relationship as a requirement for its operation, what you have is an exploitation vector. I can give you an example of that from my past. There was a point in time when I was working with a travel company where very simply we were buying travel vouchers from the airline uh, and we were selling them at a markup. And we would buy the, we would get a good deal on these vouchers because we we're buying these codes at, uh, at a discount and uh, in, in bulk. And then we were selling them at near market rate. The problem was the man in our organization who managed the relationship with the airline did not have the scruples that we gave him. We were trusting him with millions of dollars to make these purchases. And then one day, the size of the purchase exceeded his uh, threshold of trustworthiness. And he said, okay, $2 million, that's a big chunk of change. I can just walk with this money and uh, you know, escaped to the Caribbeans or wherever the, wherever the heck he decided to go to. It tanked our business because we trusted a man to be a linchpin in our business process. What blockchain promises in that type of a situation and many others is to remove the requirement for trust. You don't need to trust people when you're working with objectively measurable concepts. And that concept can be uh, you trust a bank to move your funds, we can trust the Bitcoin blockchain to do that for you and there's no humans to exploit the trust you've given it. You can use it for chain of custody and supply chain. There's many applications for this. Uh, cryptocurrency and transferring funds just being one of them. So we'll explore some of these concepts moving forward in our what is this and how do these work segments uh, moving forward. But that gives you a basic uh, grounding in the concept of blockchain so you can understand what is it really here for. And again, just succinctly, it's to remove the requirement of trust in any type of business relationship or counterparty relationship. So for today's how-to, we're gonna show you the very basics, how to set up a wallet. What is a Bitcoin wallet? What is a cryptocurrency wallet? It's just like what it sounds like. As a, a wallet is a place to put your money and your ID and your information. A Bitcoin wallet is just a place to collect all the private keys and public keys that are associated with where your money goes, where your cryptocurrency money goes. You can see on my screen, I've got a bunch of wallets here. I've got, as you can see, Jack's wallet. I've got something called Shapeshift. We'll get into that at some point. I got Coinomi, Coinbase, Green Address, Mycelium. I got a bunch of stuff. Uh, so what, will, what, what are the, why? Why are there so many wallets? Uh, well, let's get down to, there's basically fall into two categories. There's the kind of wallet that lets you control your private keys, and then there's the kind of wallet that does not. Um, I strongly encourage everybody that is gonna have serious amounts or even anything other than non-trivial amounts of cryptocurrency to think about using a wallet that allows you to control your private keys, even if you never touch them or never look at them, it's more important to be able to control your own destiny with blockchain than to rely on another organization. 
Uh, we'll get into why that is in future episodes, but just take my word for it for now and trust that we'll go into it later. So to give you an example of what cl class A and class B is, Coinbase is a great application, it's a great company, but it's a wallet that does not allow you to control your own private keys. Uh, so I don't keep anything more than non-trivial amounts of money in my Coinbase wallet, whereas Green Wallet, Mycelium, Jax, Coinomi, they all allow you to control your private keys and export your wallet and do all kinds of things. So today, we are going to set up Green Wallet because this is the only wallet on my phone that I haven't previously configured. So we'll launch it right here. First thing you see is a, uh, a screen that says, enter your mnemonic or create a wallet. So a mnemonic is a backup phrase that allows you to take your wallet, take your balance in your wallet and move it from application to application. You're not locked in with Green Wallet for your entire life. You're not locked in with most Bitcoin wallet applications for your entire life. So what we're doing here is we're on this uh, step one of three. Uh, it's giving you your mnemonic passphrase. And so I'm going to do a little shortcut here rather than what you should do is probably write this down on a piece of paper. Uh, I'm going to copy this into a little document uh, in my, my notepad here so that I can uh, save it for later. Here's why this is important. This phrase will unlock your currency. So if your phone ever gets stolen or your phone gets lost in an Uber or a taxi or something like that, and you're like, oh crap, I had $10,000 in that wallet, someone's gonna have access to that. This phrase allows you to recover your balance into a new wallet regardless of whether or not you have possession of your phone move the funds and take care of it. We'll talk about security later, but just know that that phrase is super important. It makes you confirm that you have saved that passphrase. Hit continue. Now it's gonna ask you to verify those certain words to make sure that you've, uh, make sure that you've actually saved them down. It doesn't let you cheat on this. Verify. So, looks like I guessed right. Um, now these are some, uh, some optional uh, security measures that Green Wallet offers you. Uh, I, you don't have to do it. Depends on how paranoid you want to be, and if you want to have any recovery options. But uh, if you uh, want to, if you, if you value your security more than your privacy, you'll want to fill out these options. If you value your privacy over your security, leave them blank and continue, and just hope for the best. So, you hit continue. I'm going to go for the privacy option here. Uh, this is also setting a PIN number. This will help secure you a little bit um, in case like someone picks up your wallet and says, oh, he's got a Bitcoin wallet. I'm gonna send some money. You can have a little PIN number there. I'm going with 5555. Five, five, five. I don't recommend that as a good PIN, but we're gonna do it for this. And then uh, there we go. Now we have a wallet. This will allow you to uh, send and receive. Obviously, you can't do much sending unless you have a balance, but uh, you can certainly receive. And uh, you know, we'll go into that in future episodes, the basics of sending and receiving. But this is the basic setup of a wallet. This allows you to send or receive remotely and uh, control your own keys. So today's project profile is going to be the Golem project. So this is a very interesting project. We today discussed a little bit about the basis of blockchain. I'm gonna skip just a tiny bit ahead and tell you about Turing Complete Blockchain and then we're gonna come back to Golem. We're gonna explore Turing Complete Blockchains on a future episode, but if you remember when I said what blockchain was, I said it was a database technology. There's a thing called a Turing Complete Blockchain which extends the idea of a database technology into database plus compute. The biggest example, probably most well-known example of a Turing complete blockchain is the Ethereum project. Uh, it, the, the weakness of Ethereum is that, aside from it being in its infancy and still growing and still being added to, features added to it, is that it has a, a very long uh, block resolution time, not in relationship to other blockchains, it's actually pretty quick in relationship to most blockchains, but it's a long resolution time from a command being issued to it being executed if you compare it to literally any other computer on the planet. If, imagine if you had your computer and you hit a letter on your keyboard and then 30 seconds later the, the letter appeared on your screen. That's what we're talking about with Ethereum. So what Golem 
attempts to do is to make the, the resolution time on computing projects much faster so it can actually resemble something closer to a cloud-based computing system like what we see with Google or Amazon or Rackspace or these other types of computers. So when you talk about Gollum, you're talking about a few different things. They were one of the first projects to do an ICO. So when people talk about Gollum, sometimes they're talking about the token that was related to that ICO. And sometimes we're talking about the aim of the project. We're going to talk about both. First, we're going to talk about the ICO itself. It was one of the first tokens to be issued to, uh, not the first, but one of the first successful tokens to be issued to raise money for a blockchain-based project. They issued a total of 1 billion tokens. They had it broken up into several different pools. Uh, and they, uh, they uh, raised $8.6 million dollars in just a few minutes of being out on the market, which at the time is unheard of. Now you see hundreds of millions of dollars raised in seconds on some of these ICOs, but at the time it kind of set the pace as what a successful ICO actually looks like. It's one of those tokens where if you had bought it at the beginning and continued to hold it and not try to day trade it, you would have made money. A thousand dollars in spent on the ICO on listing day would be roughly equivalent to forty-five thousand dollars today if you just bought it and hold it, held it. This graph here kind of shows the uh, the magnitude of the growth, and then the current scope of the project uh, is actually broken up into several phases. They have some clever names of it. They go with brass golem. Uh, clay golem, stone golem, iron golem. Essentially, these are just the phases of what they're trying to do. So the, the first one they're working on is called brass golem. And uh, instead of uh, trying to eat the whole elephant at once, they're taking little bites. The first bite is strictly trying to apply this concept of blockchain cloud-based computing to graphics rendering, CGI, like what you see in movies. They're working with a, a CGI rendering software called Blender. And the idea is that you're going to take your rendering project, you'll send it up to the Golem cloud, you'll pay for that uh, compute time with Golem tokens, which will then be dispersed to the individual computers being used to render your project out in the Golem cloud. Once it's done, it'll be reassembled and sent back to you as a completed project. So every piece of the render network makes a little bit of money over their spare compute cycles. You get a at or below market rate for uh, is purchasing exactly the amount of computing power that you need for your project, and everybody uh, conceivably wins. To put a fine point on it or to elevator pitch this, this is essentially the Uberization or the Airbnb of cloud-based computing. So you're spreading your compute uh, requirements across hundreds or thousands of machines across a cloud network. Uh, the next few chunks in the Golem project are, are basically taking that away from just being a graphics compute cloud and putting it into general purpose computing and all the different pieces of technology that go along with that. But that, that gives you the, the basic idea of what it's going, what, where they're headed and what they're going, uh, what they're going to do with this. The, the pros and the cons, we're going to end with this. They have a strong technical team. These are on the pro category. They have a strong technical team. They've worked for free for a long time, which is something you like to see. You can always chart out the growth and the development of these projects by looking at their GitHub repositories. If you don't know what that is, uh, go do a quick Google on it. GitHub is where they store all their open source based code. And all of these ICOs tend to rely on a lot of open source code. So it's very easy to see if they're putting uh, real effort into this or if they're just talking a good game. And Gollum was one of those projects that actually put real effort into it before they were even making money or before they were soliciting funds from the public. Uh, this idea fills a real market need, a real market niche. The, Gaul, uh, the, the blockchain ecosystem needs this. And uh, they were funded far before the ICO market is as frothy as it is today. They got, they, they've, been, they've been at this a while. Here's the cons though. They've slipped uh, quite a few development uh, targets uh, in the lifetime of the project. They were uh, hoping to have in August and, or September a working version of this, and they still, uh, in, towards the end of 2017, don't have a, a working public version of this. They still have, they, have some, they have some semblance of a working thing, but nothing that they've opened up to the public. Uh, the biggest complaint in the forums is that at this time, it's still difficult to implement as a user 
even for interested power users and experienced uh, Blender users. So they've got a long way to go on the UX and the UI, which is a very common complaint with most blockchain projects. So there's, there's a lot of business opportunities with this. Uh, well, you can uh, check out some of the notes that go along with this show to kind of see where our further thoughts are on this project. But that gives you a general overview of Gollum as a whole and why it's valuable and what we think of it. Well, there you have it, your blockchain and cryptocurrency prescription. As always, these are just my thoughts and I encourage you to seek out a second opinion. Subscribe for more videos on blockchain and cryptocurrency. And if you enjoyed today's video, share it with a friend so they can see. Thanks for watching and don't forget to see the receptionist on your way out. Stay classy, San Diego. <laughs>